Ladies and gentlemen, since I did not see any chairman of this session here, I take the liberty of doing it myself. Also, I have been always told you should reward people that are early and not the ones that are late. So we will simply start. And I hope there will not be too much disturbance from still people coming in in the audience. So the session is about EIT ICT labs. And what we will do is together with three of my colleagues, we will give you a little bit more details about what is going on in, in the kick. In a 45 minutes uh, session, it's very difficult to tell what meanwhile an army of around 1,500 people in our kick is doing on a daily basis. So it will only be a snapshot and it will mainly about our approach and our methodology and not so much about concrete cases because the concrete cases you can find in our written material, in the leaflets, in the annual report of 2011 and also on our website. It's also interaction, so if you feel that uh, you, uh, you want to start a discussion, please uh, interrupt at any point in time. Uh, we don't mind. Uh, we even encourage uh, to do so. I want to show you this framework picture as a kind of overall picture for how we see our role. So first of all, our mission, we see our mission is to drive the innovation in ICT in Europe for two purposes. One is economic growth, and the other is enhancing the quality of life of people. And in order to do so, in the framework of the EIT, we have a number of strategic components which make our approach different from other approaches that you see around. And I listed those elements. So one very important thing, of course, in the context of EIT is the knowledge triangle, the seamless integration of research, business, and education. And what that concretely means will, made, will be made clear later on. The other thing that's very important is that the EIT is a European instrument. So we are not there to just top up money on completely local initiatives. There's other sources for that. Our money should be spent to create the European dimension. That's very, very important. Another important element is that EIT has deliberately chosen to focus on the societal challenges. And that gives a certain guidance to our work and it also shows that we feel a responsibility towards society. This question about what is the role of EIT in society and also what is the role of EIT in the European landscape has been asked before. And sometimes people said, well, EIT is just for the elite, for the excellence, and not for those who are not. This is simply not true. EIT is indeed focusing on excellence and on talent. But it does this to mobilize those people to the benefit of everybody. So what is part of our mission is to make our scientific and entrepreneurial elite really aware that they are there to serve society. And I think that that is one of the most important things maybe underlying what we are aiming to do. Because if you see what is going on in society, that a lot of people have the idea that the elites in our society are more working for themselves than for the society as a whole. We're focusing on excellence and talent. And I mentioned how we want to mobilize them. 
Then there is a certain foundation which is underlying our approach, and that's of course the EIT brand. If somebody asked to me what is the most valuable in the kick, then my name is the EIT brand, because no other organization can use this brand. It's unique. It's a unique asset we have. And that's why it's so important to establish this brand and make it shine. Another very important thing about the EIT and about the KICS is that a KIC is not just another project. It is a strategic partnership with the EIT for a first framework agreement of seven years and the second one foreseen for another seven years. That means that we can work on structural game changers because we are able and we have the time to really structurally change things. And if you want to make some structural changes in the way we educate our students, most of you know that that's a very complex and lengthy process. And what we did in the master school, for example, where more than 20 universities signed a contract with the KIC to build a unique, uniform ICT master program, they would not have done that if that would only be for a three years project. They do that because they have the prospect of a long-term relationship with the KIC. That's, that's very important, this longevity. The funding model is also a very important way of looking at it. And I would rather say it's more an investment model than a funding model, where we invest only in those areas where our partnership and our ecosystem is willing to invest a lot more themselves. Because why should we put our precious money on opportunities that the ecosystem itself does not find of enough value to invest of it themselves? So that's very important. And then, of course, the drive for results. Maybe the conference is a little bit early because we started only in January 2011. I signed the contract for our kick as the first kick on December 13th, 2010. And of course, the first thing you have to do is to build the organization to set up the structure because the kick is a complete new entity and to learn how these ingredients are put to work. So I would say what you can expect today is to get a, a feeling for the journey we are undertaking. Do we exactly know our destination? Sorry, I have to disappoint you. But I'm in good company because I had a meeting with the chief technology officer of Siemens who showed me a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. And the end of the bridge was in the fog. And I said, well, if a company like Siemens, which has been around for more than 100 years, still thinks its future is foggy, then I'm excused not to know exactly where we will be in 10 years from now, right? What's also important for us is a kick is all about people. Any organization is all about people. Structure is just there to facilitate people to do their work and to flourish. And that's why we put our values and principles at the bottom of our organization, as the real pillars on which we build. And I'm not going to read them out to you. The only thing is, at the bottom, you should read that we want to be fast. And what fast means is written there. Many of you are familiar with FP7 projects, with framework projects. And many of you know the limitations of those projects. Before I joined the KIC, I was working as a research executive in Philips. And very often, I had to make choices about alignment of investments I made in European projects and support I had to deliver to the Philips business units. And the thing I always run into was the following. When I was talking with the CEOs of our business units, they were asking for quick results and they had a two to three year horizon. When I was talking in Brussels for a FP7 project, 
it took me a year to set up an appropriate consortium. Then it took me another year to negotiate the project. And then I got a project for three years, delivering results at the end. It was a five-year journey. This is very difficult in industry to align a five-year cycle with a two to three year business cycle. And what is the result? The result is that industry does not put his core strategic innovations in the context of these European ecosystems because it's simply too slow. And that's also why a lot of industries walk away from these programs because it does not deliver to their core. It's nice to do some long-term projects, but it does not deliver to their core. And we see this as our mission. So what are we? Today, we are an open innovation ecosystem at the European level. And I would say, read the book of Chesboro if you want to know what an open innovation ecosystem is. That's where we are today. However, that is by far not enough yet to really have impact in the core business of our organizations. So the first thing we have to do is we have to show that we are able to deliver because we will not be believed upon our blue eyes. I don't even have blue eyes, so it will be a very difficult one for me anyway. So we need to prove with results. And that means that for me, the year 2012 and 2013 we have to come with the very concrete, tangible results that make impact in our partner organization, either in terms of changing the innovation in education, changing the way people do research, and really having impact with bringing results from our innovations to our core partners, as well as creating new companies. And in the end, what we want to be is we want to be a trusted core innovation partner. We want to create a position with the kick where we are trusted. And we can do so, we believe, because we are a long-term partnership. We can do so, we believe, because we are very selective of who is part of that partnership. And it's not just everybody who likes to be there is there and then in the end hardly contributes because that is really what is killing a partnership. It's not the good performers that are killing partnerships, it's the poor performers that are killing partnerships and make everybody cynical. So we have to be very, very critical on that. And that's our ambition, and that's where we are out for. And that will take five to 10 years. Let's be very realistic about that. That's not an overnight thing. How do we work in our organization? Well, we have four important stages. So first of all, we want to obtain a position where we set the agenda. What does that mean? We think we have the right people in our consortium. If you look at ICT Lab, 70% of the ICT innovations in Europe, in investment, 70% of the investment of, of ICT innovation in Europe, in R&D, is, is in our partnership. So we think we have the best and brightest. But what we want to achieve is that we will set the agenda. And concretely that means if there is a discussion about the role of ICT and the future development of ICT in Europe, and I'm not invited to the table, we have failed. If in one of the partner countries where we are, there are important national discussions about the ICT agenda, and our national node director is not invited to the table, we have failed. That's the position we want to achieve in five years from now. And that's the concrete measure we take. It's nice to set the agenda, but then you have an agenda, so what? You put it on the shelf and you go on. No. What we can also do is we can mobilize our partnership. We really have processes in place to around our action lines, and I will tell you how that exactly works, we can mobilize people and make sure that we make joint plans with the agenda driving those plans to really have the impact. Okay, but then you mobilized 
the group. It's like organizing a party. A lot of people come, but what will be the result? Only drunk people on the street is not good enough. So the next thing is, of course, executing those programs. And that is, of course, where our strength is, because we have the financial means to really execute. If you look at the budget for ICT labs this year, it's something like 25 million from the EIT, supplemented with something like 80 million from the partnership that gives 100 million in a single year to invest in ICT innovation. So that means we are really able to make something happen. It also puts a high responsibility on the kick to deliver, because in the end, part of that money is taxpayers' money that we are spending. And then, of course, in the end, it's all about delivering results. And we want to deliver in three areas. We want to deliver in innovating our education systems to make sure we have the right people. We want to innovate in companies, existing ones, growing SMEs, helping startups in order to make sure that new ICT solutions make it to the market. And of course, we also want to innovate in the way we do research by making sure that researchers are really finding a good balance between long-term research and more goal-driven research. What's very key in our approach, and I showed it yesterday very briefly, is this carrier catalyst model. This is for us a fundamental way, and the whole kick is organized around this model. So we start from carrier projects that are existing activities that are going on in our ecosystem, and we add, as a catalyst, money on top. And it shows how the money flows, but it also shows about the mindset. I'll give you some concrete examples how this works in practice. So if you look at education, so what is the carrier? It's an existing education program. What is the catalyst? It's the entrepreneurship and innovation skills that we want to bring to the table, and we want our students to absorb. And if you put this catalyst and carrier together, it will start producing the kind of students that we are aiming at. Another issue is patents. I love to have a long debate about the pros and cons of patents in Europe, the world, whatever. I worked with Philips for more than 10 years, was heavily involved in all kinds of patent debates. The company has over 100,000 patents in its portfolio, so there are big things at stake. So with a beer, I love to talk about it. No matter what, patents are important. And when I go to a room with researchers and I ask them, how many of you have more than 10 scientific papers in their name? Almost everybody raises his hand. And if I then ask, how many of you have three patents in your name? Almost nobody raises his hand. And that is a problem because you cannot build economic value on paper, but you can build it on patent. So that's one of the areas we're looking at, and that's one of the catalysts we're putting money in. And if you apply that, for example, to existing research projects, and you do a scan, a patent scan before you start your research, you help them formulating so-called invention disclosures. You help them in the application process. The number of patents you get out of an organization is growing. Writing patents is not difficult. Writing good patents is difficult but it's a manageable process. Another catalyst. What very often happens is that in a local ecosystem, certain technology is developed. So in this case, VTT was developing very nice technology for Nokia. But then there was a strategic change in Nokia and the technology, although it was very good, it was obsolete in this local ecosystem. Where the kick can help is to connect it, in this case, to the Paris node and find a outlet for this technology. And there you see also the European dimension very clearly. And rather 
than the results being put on the shelves, they now show up in concrete products and services. I showed you this catalyst set already. Have a look at it. It's the kind of tools that we are using to stimulate innovation. And you see them in the area of education, you see them in the area of research, and you see the area of business. And Klaus and Hanu will tell a bit about that. Olivier had to go back, so I will take the research part later on. What I said already, the carrier catalyst model is extremely important for us. So that means you should start from the carrier. Non-EIT funding is not a matter of thinking about what you want to do with the EIT money and then going around and see whether you can find the other money as well. No, you have to start from something which you think is interesting to give a boost. So the carrier first, and that's what we tell our people and that's how we work. And if you have that carrier, you have to be able to explain to us what do you want to achieve here? So you say, okay, I did a PhD project, I got a very nice prototype out of it, and I want to create a startup. Very clear, short message, clear message. Or you say, I have an education system here, and I really want to have an entrepreneurial module that tells much more on patent writing. Very clear. But you have to have a good basis, and then you have to have a good goal. And we will judge that. And if we feel that this is worth putting our money, we will have a discussion and then say, okay, what are the kind of catalysts you need? So if you want to start a company from a piece of technology, you probably need a business model, right? Would be great. So we can help you with a catalyst to have a business model. It would probably be nice if you set up a company that you have a good team with a CEO, with a financial guy. The technical guy normally is not a problem, but the financial and the marketing guys are the problem. So we can help you with another catalyst to build your team. And when you have a business model and a team, in the end, it's all uh, very important to have a launching customer. Because startups that have a launching customer turn out to be much more successful than the ones that do not have in the initial phase. Yeah. That's how Microsoft built itself on the shoulders of IBM as a launching customer for their operating system. So we can help them with what we call soft landing, connect them to a launching customer. That's how simple the story in the end is. That's all. To organize this a little bit, we work with action lines. We've chosen the word action on purpose because we want to see things happen. These action lines consist of a collection of catalyst carrier opportunities. And these action lines have a longer term focus. Some of them may have a focus of five years, some of two years, and some may only be very short term activities that last for a year. The way the KIC and the EIT is set up that on an annual basis, we present our business plan for the next year. And actually that is a window that shifts on an annual basis through our action line strategy. So year by year, we proceed in implementing our action line strategies. An action line is an opportunity portfolio around a specific theme. It's an opportunity portfolio, and that's how our action line leaders should look at it. And they should be able to explain if they fund in their action line a certain activity and they invest in it, what is the opportunity here? And if they are not able to explain that, we will not allocate the budget to those activities. And it's also very important that our activities in the action line have a clear European dimension. It's very important for the EIT to position itself very clearly in the landscape of European instruments. And there are many instruments around. There is national funding, there is structural funds, there is the ERC for the long-term investment. So we have to position ourselves clearly. And that's very, very, very fundamental. And we can position ourselves very clearly because we are about innovation and we are working at the European level. There's many innovation in uh, initiatives going on in local ecosystem, but none at the European level the way we are running it. 
And if you look in Horizon 2020, our position is very clear. There's a lot of emphasis on long-term research in the ERC. There's a lot of emphasis in integrated projects, but there is not a lot of emphasis on really bringing those things together in an innovation instrument. And that's where we sit. And sometimes I get questions actually from CTOs of companies and they say, Willem, we see all these instruments, where do I put my project? And we can help there. And my story is very clear. If you want to do long-term research, go to ERC. If you want to do exploratory consortium like R&D, go to the framework projects. If you are out after, if you are after innovation, come to us. If you have specific innovation opportunities, come to us. And that's of course a rule of thumb, and that covers 80% of the truth, but this is roughly when you should come to us. These are the action lines that we are working on. And we are not different from other organizations in the themes that we cover, yeah? because many people work on smart energy systems. Yes? But we are different in the way we work. And I will show you a few things. Smart energy systems, we are about bringing smart grid innovations to the market. And we do two things here. One thing is really focused on pan-European testbeds, because the big challenge of smart grid is stability in the network when you have an unreliable collection of energy providers. There's not a big plant pumping the stuff in with a kind of backup system and so on. No, there are all kinds of providers all over the place that pump in energy to the system. And how are you going to manage that? This is a control system, and that should not get out of hand. And actually, chaos theory helps because small disturbances in parts of the network may make the whole in the interdependent network fail. Now, you can only get a grip on that through simulation because the mathematical models underlying are just too complex to analytically solve, even numerically solve. And that's the kind of experiments we're doing on a pan-European level, and we're connecting our test beds here. Another area we're working on is smart spaces. And this is about the story I told before. What we see the big thing happening in ICT is the blending of the physical and the cyber world. And smart, smart spaces is about this. It's about ICT being omnipresent in all kinds of applications and how do you interact with it. It's about interaction technology, but it's also about artificial intelligence. It's also about sensor technology, it's about context awareness, it's about privacy, it's about personalization. That's all the topics we are covering here. Another huge thing that is out is the big data challenge. I just read yesterday that in 2015, an average household has three to four terabyte of information in his home. Going fast, right? And probably not only in his home, but partially also in the cloud. An average household. An enormous amount of data. And of course, the big challenge is partly managing all the data, but the real big challenge is making sense out of all that data. And that's where we are focusing our efforts. The work that we carry out is work that we carry out in our co-location centers. And sometimes we get the question, hey, you're an ICT kick. So does location matter for ICT? Because you have networks, you can connect to everybody all over the place. Why do you still have physical co-location centers? Well, part of the answer is, that video conferencing systems on average still have lousy performance. But another part of the answer is that really bringing people physically together gives the kind of interaction that cannot be achieved through communication means today 
and probably not in the near future either. And what we are doing in our co-location centers and how this works is something that will be explained by Roberto, who is running one of our co-location centers as the node director in Italy. Roberto? Buongiorno. Well, yes, uh, we are based in, uh, in Trento, and uh, we actually joined the uh, ICT labs in, uh, on January 1st this year. Uh, as you can see from the picture, we have a nice building, and it gives the impression that we are in, uh, in some sort of plains, but actually we are um, situated on the mountains. Okay, this is the trick that Photoshop is doing. Um, we have uh, an environment that is rich. We have a lot of uh, things going on. Uh, we have startups uh, uh, around the place. We have what is called the Semantic Valley. Uh, we have uh, uh, infrastructures that is coming up uh, very, very strongly in addition to what we already have. We are uh, <clears throat> a cluster of uh, partners. We have uh, partners from the industrial environment and uh, we have partners from the academia. Even more important, uh, we have very strong connection with local institution. And I think this is one really, something very, very important if you really want to succeed in ICT in a big way. And we also have several startups. Now, if I'm looking at the uh, industrial partners, uh, we've got Telecom Italia, CRF, ST Microelectronics, um, uh, Trend to Rise is part industry and part academia, CRF, Fiat. Well, they represent a major part of the Italian ICT environment. And if you're looking at probably all the connection they have, all the communities and, and enterprises they are interacted with, probably you go over 90% of what is ICT in Italy. So it's a very major portion. But still, this part is about 4% of the Italian GDP, and 2% is uh, the infrastructure part of the ICT, and 2% is the application part of the ICT. It's about 60 billion euros for Italy, versus a GDP that is uh, 1,600 billion. What is important to notice is the fact that if you are serious about ICT, then you shouldn't be self-referential, just developing application for the sake of application, but you should look at the verticals. And if you're looking at the verticals, you're discovering that uh, by inserting ICT and by changing processes in those verticals, you can save something like 5 to 8%, which is more than the double of the ICT itself. And that's really the part that we are most interested in. Not ICT for ICT, but ICT for <clears throat> the complete business environment. And of course, this is just a part of the story and a little part of the story, because as uh, Willem mentioned before, the most important part is what is really ICT for? Well, it's for the well-being, for, uh, for getting a better quality of life. And of course, every one of us have a slightly different meaning about quality of life. What is better for you probably is not better for me or something like that. So it's a very complex environment. And you have really to interact with the territory if you really want to, to move forward in, in this kind of area. Now, how can you do this kind of thing? Willem already mentioned the fact, the importance of the fact that, that uh, we are with ICT connecting the physical world with the bits, okay? But it goes even beyond that, that part uh, of thing. Because actually, what we are seeing that if you are manipulating bits, the cost of manipulation is very, very low. It's so much more expensive to manipulate atoms and the result of this is the fact that most of the services today and in the future will happen at the bit level. And what you need to do is to connect these services that are coming at the bit level with the atoms, because by the end of the day, as we say in Italy, you're going to eat spaghetti, not the virtual spaghetti. Okay? Well, how you do that? You cannot do just by developing application. If you really are looking at the big picture, you have to involve the institution, because the institution is what uh, is providing you the framework that lets you extract data, digitalize atoms into bits, and then you can have the ICT world working on bits. And then you again need institution to transpose the digital computation into atoms to affect the real world. And 
once you have that sort of umbrella covering it, what you need is the industry and the academia developing through research what is needed, what is the starting point for developing innovation. And then, of course, you have innovation. And innovation goes across education. This is particularly important. Education is about the master, but it's also about the people. Okay, every one of us has to be educated in, in ICT and the effect of ICT. So just looking at the very first uh, few months that we have uh, been part of this uh, environment, what are the um, takeaway, the early takeaway? Uh, well, starting from the most difficult one to the easiest one, I would say that the first one, but the most difficult one, is to create a feeling of belonging. We've got a bunch of partners, okay? It's, it's like herding uh, cats. <laughs> Each one of these partners is going his own way because they are coming from their own way and with their own objective and say, but what we need to have is a common fabric. We need to have part of this partner, I mean part of a partner, the start of the thing in terms, I belong to the ICT labs and I belong to that because I want to build something that I cannot do by myself all alone. So a common fabric made of partners. The, the second most difficult thing is to drive the local ecosystem, to become really a cog in the, in, a, in the territory. And that is difficult because the territory is already working, it's moving forward, okay, and it's already organized with the, its own processes. We want to become part of these processes, and that implies changes in those processes. So this is also very difficult. But working together with the institution, working with the people and letting know the people what we're doing, we are uh, getting closer, or at least we're walking in that direction. The other thing is to integrate in the European context, to be a hub and spoke at the same time. And I should say that in our experience, this has been easier, much easier than the other two points. And that's because we have uh, been fortunate in finding a very nice environment in the ICT labs. All the other nodes are, are very, very, uh, friendly and cooperative, so this is an easy part. Let me say that my goal here is to have by next year that people will start talking about Trento as the sixth node, but just as a node, okay? <laughs> one of the node and not the sixth one. And the easiest one is to walk the talk. I mean, it's the easiest one, not because it doesn't have any difficulties, but in the sense that it depends only on ourselves, okay? Uh, we have been talking about research, innovation, education, and these are three different constituencies. But within the node, we're really bringing these things together, and we can do it, it's just depending on us. So in this sense, it's easier to do this kind of thing than the other, where we are interacting with other parts. And we are trying to practice this kind of thing, and we are keeping on every day in merging, bringing together people from research, people that are turning research into innovation, and having these kind of people working with academia and explaining what they want to do and embedding their ideas into the courses that academia is providing. And also talking with lower level uh, school, like colleges and so on. So they are part of our ecosystem. And since I've been talking about uh, education as last point, let me give the floor to Anu, who is our big <laughs> education director. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I try to be very short, which those who know me may be difficult. So let me just concentrate on one slide and, and give you a little bit behind, uh, behind, uh, behind the skin story. What is this all about? As Wilhelm and, and, uh, mentioned, we need to make a sense in, uh, in our mindset. One of the key instruments gaining the sense of how we are looking the future and today is via education. To have an European level impact, it's not enough that we change few things here and there. We need to have a very systematic approach which is scalable, which has a built-in methodology, which has processes in place, especially processes for, for quality assurance, and it needs to have a structures so we know what to do and we can actually measure each other's progress as well as exchange the students, the courses and the faculty across the partners. And all of this needs to be packed from two sides by our faculty, the individual professors, 
who find this exciting, so it's the bottom up, as well as university presidents who need to find that this partnership has a potential catalyst effect change actually what is going on in their university. Please notice that the numbers of the students, what we are still discussing as of today, are so tiny that the university president has no interest from that aspect. It's actually the process, the methodology, and the way of, of moving things forward that is of the interest. Because they can be distributed to other subject areas, to other programs, and through that have an impact. So this has been our key internal working area, is really to think how we can make this scalable. How, when we have this established now, how we can do the next step, how we can roll out the way how we are believing is our appropriate way to teach innovation and entrepreneurs. And how we should establish the partnership, the new partnership, the outreach to other members, even outside our consortia, and, and see how we can actually build this to the next level in coming years. So this is really, really, how to say, our fundamental cornerstone on, on uh, education, seeing the possibility how we create the European impact. And not only impact, if you have noticed, we have very engineering-oriented courses. However, by agreeing at the highest level of the universities that this methodology itself is acceptable and is part of the, of the degree structures, we are all already in the position that our, some of our partners are piloting our concept, methodology, and processes, really creating new type of engineering programs. It is really addressing the social impact together with other faculties completely outside the engineering domain. And this is where I believe strongly the long-term impact in our work will be in education. And this is what, where the EIT brand is really useful and where we can create a value, a bottom-up value to the EIT brand from the kick side. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, thanks, Hanno. I just will go to my slide to talk a few words about the business activities within the EIT ICT labs. And uh, as Willem already mentioned, the core of our uh, organization are the action lines, where we really, uh, each action line is a pool of innovation opportunities, and we are on the way to implement our funnel. Part of this funnel is a systematic screening and scanning of these innovation opportunities within our ecosystem, detect them, qualify them, if we came to a conclusion that this is really a promising innovation opportunity with a very good perspective to be commercialized, we will take this into our funnel as a concrete case, working out a concept, a roadmap with our partners for that, tracking, this road, uh, tracking the progress and will finally bring the successful to a technology transfer to another partner or in form of a startup to the market or what means we have there. And looking there on all our industrial partners, there we see the startups. This is a very important uh, uh, topic for us, the business creation. But our goal is really not to establish new incubators. In all our partner countries, there are good incubators there. Our goal is to bring the European dimension into, to connect these incubators and uh, uh, bring them together. One example for a very good uh, best practice is our investment readiness program. So uh, uh, in each of the, of the incubators we had in our network, they have such investment readiness program, making an venture ready 
for a presentation for venture capitalists. We collected all the information of these uh, this, uh, incubators we have in our network, brought them together, uh, discussing the approaches and the best practices, and I think this was a very, very valuable exercise for all of them. But then, in addition to that, we brought the European dimension into that now every of these ventures, they get trained by these incubators for the presentation of the venture capitalists. They can state we are part of a strong European ecosystem that help us to extend our business out of our regional, of our local market. Yeah? And this is an example how we brought the European dimension into. And the second is the SMEs. One thing is the business creation to put the new company uh, to incorporate them. But then they should grow. They should become big. And here also, I think, we have to help these companies to grow on a European level. One example uh, uh, we were quite successful was we brought a, a small SME from Finland together with uh, Orange, one of our partners in France. And they together now conquer the African market with a service the Finnish SME offers. Yeah? This is also an example how we help the SMEs to grow on a European level, to help them to find customers, to find contacts via our network within the other European countries and uh, extend successfully their business beyond their regional and national borders. And finally, the large companies Alexander de Gabay had it yesterday on his slides as Europe's past, yeah? But I think the Ericsons, the Philips, the Siemens, they are Europe's present, and there will be Europe's future, yeah? At least a strong part of it. And they have to innovate uh, themselves as well. And they, you know, or let's say it in the other way around, they wouldn't have survived over more than a century if they didn't innovate almost on a, on a daily basis. But the challenge for them is really to innovate out of their running business. I was deeply involved in a large company in running a business, and I know how difficult it is if you have your daily business to get running to keep some room free for innovations. And here, I think, the kick can help them as well with access to the creativity of the research institutes, of the universities, with the access to the SMEs, to new technologies, and things like that. So, but we have to be aware that the whole economy is in a transition phase. The overall penetration of ICT, we see it in our daily life with the Facebooks, with the iPhones we have, with all these means, yeah. But this changes as well a lot the way our econom economy is working the way how we produce, the way how we trade, the way how we commerce, yeah? And this we have in mind as well, and so we have a lot to experiment within the kick, with new methodologies, with new ideas on the business and on the, uh, the whole business environment we have in place. And sometimes we have things turn around by 180 degrees. So we have on the one hand an ongoing, really change in the overall business environment, we have to be aware of. And on the other hand, we have the challenge really to boost the innovation on a European level. And these are the challenges for me within the KIC EID ICT labs from the business side. Thank you. Actually, Klaus promised me that he would stand on his head, but uh, given that we are a bit running out of time, we will leave that for next session. Olivier already uh, left. I want to say only a few short words, because as I said, we are running out of time, uh, about research. So we are active in research. The way we are active in the research domain is that we are focusing on preparing research results to make them ready for exploitation. And that's all about making sure that they are mature enough that they can be taken up for business exploitation. And mature, maturity may mean 
uh, further developing the uh, prototype implementations that are around maturity may be in, uh, making sure that the patents uh, are, uh, are in place. It may mean uh, make sure that it is available as open source. So many, many activities in, in research uh, there. And especially in the area of pan-European testbeds, which really require European dimension to do large-scale experiments, is something that is very much driving our work there. That's it. I would say, uh, if this is still not enough, please visit our website. We're uh, available 24 hours, uh, over 24 hours, seven days a week. And if you are sometimes not connected to the network, you can download our annual report of 2011, which will give you uh, hopefully some nice reading during the upcoming holiday period. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.